and welcome to SVG TV News for Monday, November 11th, 2019. I am Investor Boins with the details. Prayers for peace were offered up on Sunday at a Remembrance Day Parade and Wreath Lane ceremony held at the Cenotaph in capital Kingstown. The Cenotaph was built in remembrance of those who paid the ultimate sacrifice during the two world wars. Members of the RSVG Police Force and the Diplomatic Corps as well as representatives from friendly nations were in attendance to commemorate the day. Wreaths were laid by the Governor General, the Speaker of the House of Assembly, the Prime Minister, a representative of the opposition, faith-based organizations and representatives of friendly nations. Recognizing the sacrifice made by those who fought in the two world wars, representatives from various faith-based organizations offered prayers on behalf of the fallen soldiers. This longing for the Lord, I count on his word. My soul is longing for the Lord more than watchman for the brain. Let the watchman count on the brain and Israel on the Lord. Because with the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. Israel indeed he will redeem from all its iniquity. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, it's now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Men, women, and children brutally attacked and murdered in the village of town. Today, we remember especially those victims of the two world wars, including those who remember here today and who paid the ultimate price. Remember those who came home with terrible injuries, both physical and psychological, and those whose loved ones never returned. Rest eternal, grant unto them, O Lord, that thy perpetual shine upon them. May they rest in peace. We pray for the country that we shall be. We pray for the, those who are in leadership for God. I pray, oh God, that you lead them in the right way. I pray, oh God, that you allow them to lead us the way that you want. And so, Father, we bless your name. We magnify your name because you are all in us. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for what has been done. We thank you, God, for what you are doing even now. And so, we thank you for the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Some vendors removed by the police from Middle Street in Capital Kingston following last Tuesday's shooting incident have expressed disappointment with the move which they say have impacted their business and livelihood. On Thursday, as part of a police operation, several temporary structures were removed from the area including those along the gallery of Ace Hardware. Since then, the police have maintained a presence in the area as some vendors have reportedly tried to return to ply their trade. Our news team today caught up with some of the vendors, mostly young men, who said they feel wronged, even though they are aware of the reasons why the police decided to take action in removing their stalls. Sometimes, mommy, sometimes we, we come down, when you come now, they move the table, them, so we go come and stand up with everything in your hand. Police, them come in and tell you, what are you doing there, you're eye-glain. You have us. So with them, what we do, with them, what we do, with them, we move the table them from this so. Move my bridging thing from here, the others. Don't make trouble, nobody here, don't make trouble. Nobody wrong here, and his baby ain't walking now. So if you could get a little thing from your people, them in foreign and put on a table and sell. Which I eat a food, you know, and go home and take care of your kids and things. Is the youth, it be young people. It's not a big old people. The young people with youth, with children to try and help themselves. All back down there with the hot dog, okay, you down there with the hot dog grill. My boy get children and things where you have to send school every day. Yeah. And his dies we using for send them school. Now that he ain't there. He ain't there. He ain't lock up. up. Now we'll find something else we do. At least he man them okay. Like if they move this table here, because they may move plenty here. They may move much people here. The others, them just pick out certain people and come and just squeeze in from them. They check what show you know. Must be because he black. Ah, uh, so the people lying in, part them see crowd is where they tackling. Now, with them they put in, with them they watching now, 
some people them will come here and they might like involving some things. Some of them do even sell here. You check. We do make trouble wrong here. It's just hustle with the hustle wrong here and try to make a little dollar all the way. And here I'm gonna wear young people. Some of we get children. Well, it could say at least 15 years. And they even then after school is just here. I ain't got nowhere else to go, nowhere else, nothing else to do. Right here, that hustle all the time, 24 7, day and night. Well, I just sell drinks, I just sell clothes, sometimes I just sell a little stockings, so really, they did them. Them kind of thing I just sell. Me, me and see nowhere else in town, then go, then go to Powee, because all over the town is the same place, same thing, everywhere you go is the same thing happening. So, me know what I'm trying to do up to now. Say that it's a very harsh thing because, as you know, Sometimes we just get to youth, we look for little works and things come, try to be like self employed, little entrepreneurs. But sometimes we have like a fight down from Babylon, so we just have to just give God thanks and pray still. Other vendors and some members of the public who did not want to speak on camera told our news team that they are pleased with the action taken by the police, noting that it should have been done a long time ago as they expressed security concerns in the area which they say needs regular patrols. When we contacted the town board, who is responsible for vending in capital Kingstown to speak on the issue, they declined to do so. Last Tuesday's shooting of Lionel George, who remains hospitalized, is the second in the Middle Street area for the year. The first incident took place on September 9th, resulting in the death of Tevin Williams of Rockies. Transnational Institute, an organization based in the Netherlands, will be providing assistance to farmers who are interested in the medical cannabis industry. A four-day workshop opened last Friday for the medicinal cannabis farmers, and TNI's representative Pin Metau told the more than 100 participants that they are happy to lend support to SVG in the development of its medical cannabis industry. We've been working with Spirit for 10 years now, and he has been part of our international group of farmers to voice your concerns and to voice the concerns of the growers to be part of a legal market. We applaud the initiatives from St. Vincent government and we really think they are an important step forward in the right direction. Metal noted that Transnational Institute has been around for more than 40 years and outline the many gains from medicinal cannabis. Really pleasantly surprised by a nation such as St. Vincent's uh, to take this new road into regulating at least a part of the market. We also agree that regulation should go further. We think it is the international control system that forces nations to stay within the medicinal cannabis limits. But we think cannabis should be regulated as a plant for recreational consumption as well. But we know, yeah, I think you all agree, right? Minister of Agriculture Saboto Caesar updated farmers on the progress made so far in the local medical cannabis industry and again appealed to them to work in groups which he said has far-reaching benefits. If Latai thinks that as a traditional cultivator, he alone could carve out a space or have a space carved out for him, it's not going to happen because he is too small. What we want is to have groups of persons, and when I say group of, groups of persons, and I'm saying to, to go form a company and make a man a director or shareholder, but there has to be established throughout the country different platforms where Rasfaco has 60 members in a Rastafari group can meet to discuss the information, to share their knowledge, and to also benefit by applying together, sourcing the material together, because there are significant discounts when you do business on a larger scale than when you do it individually. The workshop ended today and it was expected that a fair trade charter or protocol for the medical cannabis industry would have been formulated. 
Other participants at the workshop came from the Caracom Ganja Mish Commission, Colombia, Jamaica, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados and St. Lucia. Agriculture officer in charge of plant protection and quarantine Michael Delpesh is encouraging Vincentians to play a more active role in protecting the country's agriculture sector from pest and plant disease. Delpesh made the appeal during an interview with SVG TV News on the role of the plant protection and quarantine unit in ensuring the survival of the sector. Over the years, the agriculture sector has been grappling with pest and plant diseases such as the pink mealybug, the West Indian fruit fly, moko and the black cigatoka which have negatively impacted several crops and hampered trade earnings. As we hear in this report by Bavin Oliver, the department has a lot dealing with to ensure the sustainability of the vital sector. From maggot-infested fruits, which make the flesh unpalatable, larvae which feed on seeds, destroying future crop, to diseases which reduces the plant's ability to produce quality fruit, are just some of the impacts of pests and diseases which can destroy the country's agriculture sector. Charged with the responsibility of preventing this from happening is the Plant Protection and Quarantine Department. Its head, Michael Delpers, said the department is the sector's first line of defense. He said while work is being done to control pests and diseases from spreading, they're keeping a watchful eye on keeping out new pests. One of the pests which the department has been tackling with over the years is the West Indian fruit fly. Delpers took the opportunity to highlight the difference between those which exist here and the Mediterranean fruit fly, a pest the department is trying to keep out. We have the West Indian fruit fly, Anastrepha oblica. And that affects certain commodities such as such as uh, guava and the plums, bakery plum, hog plum, and the Jamaica plum. That's as much as we know in terms of the host species. With the medfly, we expect that it would affect not only these uh, particular commodities but a wider, much wider range of agricultural commodities, fruits, and also uh, vegetables, our peppers, our cucumbers, and so on. So it has a much wider host range. Usually the fruit fly, all fruit flies, they would lay their eggs in the fruit, and then the larval stage, of that pest would develop within the fruit and uh, it's the larva that would do the damage and destroy uh, the fruit and so it makes the fruit um, unmarketable and uh, in some cases you are unable to consume the fruit because of the amount of um, larva that you would find in these fruits. Diseases can also hamper the local agriculture sector, and the banana industry has been grappling with the effects of the moko and black cigatoka disease for some time. Delpra said though it has been tough in keeping these diseases under control, one disease they are trying to keep out of the country is the Tropical Race 4, also known as TR4, and explain how devastating this disease can be. Disease, it affects the vascular system of the plant, it eventually kills the plant. And so production uh, of banana basically will become impossible once you have that disease on the farm. It's similar to the moko in that moko would also destroy uh, the banana plant. And so the costs would be extremely high in terms of the economic damage that would uh, uh, take place if that disease should really come into our St. Vincent and Grenadines. Pests are diseases which affect the agriculture sector are difficult and expensive to control, and prevention is always better than cure. Delpress explained that these diseases can be introduced by importing plants and produce and appeal to Vincentians to be responsible. Pests enter this country and generally through passengers' luggage, and it is always best that you check with the quarantine unit first to get that permission to import that particular produce or plant 
so that we can carry out all the necessary checks to make sure that you can input that particular commodity in a manner that would be safe to all of us in terms of our agriculture. For SPG TV's Evening News, I am Bobby Oliver. Caribbean countries have dropped the ball in reversing the legacy of underdevelopment in the region caused by native genocide and the enslavement of Africans. It is the sentiment shared by Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez during a conversation on reparations which took place in Tobago on Friday. We hear more in this TTT News report. Is that legacy of underdevelopment which persists today, which we must address the question of repairing. Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. Six years after he helped form the Caribbean Reparations Commission, Dr. Gonzalez laments that too little progress has been made in the region. You have to have a conversation with the British, or the French in the case of Haiti, and the, the Dutch in the case of Suriname. I'm talking about the Caribbean countries, the Caricom countries. If these efforts are futile, he says that the next course of action ought to be the employment of legal and political instruments. And one legal path forward is to bring a case to the International Court of Justice within the framework of certain conventions and more particularly the Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. But political leaders must have the bravery to exercise their power. There is political pressure which could be brought to resolutions at the United Nations, uh, other um, forms of work which we can do through specialized agencies of the United Nations and other international bodies which we are member. Dr. Gonzalez was the feature speaker at a Caribbean Reparations Update, the issue of reparations for native genocide and slavery, hosted by the Tobago Writers Guild. A rodent problem which posed a potential health hazard to the students and staff at the Kittel's government school is said to have been remedied and classes are expected to resume tomorrow, Tuesday, November 12th. A news release from the Ministry of Education said it was informed last Wednesday, November 6th of the rodent problem by the management of the school and an immediate decision was made to suspend classes for the remainder of the week in order to guard against the potential hazard and to allow the relevant authorities to intervene. The ministry said the Environmental Health Unit was immediately contacted and responded with school visits last Thursday and Friday to assess and address the problem. The Ministry of Education was informed that, cl that classes could resume today, Monday, November 11, having completed a full assessment of the facility. However, as a further precaution, the ministry said it made the decision to keep the school closed until tomorrow, Tuesday, November 12, and thank all parents, students, and staff of the Kittel's government school for their understanding, patience, and cooperation on the matter. The Petit Bodel Secondary School today received over $20,000 EC worth of reading materials to enhance the students' literacy skills from Hodder Education, a UK-based publishing company. Local representative of the Hodder Education, Byron Wilson, said on a visit to the school a few years ago, the teachers told him about the idea of repairing the school's reading room or library so that the students would be more involved in reading. Wilson encouraged the students to make use of the reading materials and take good care of them so that they would be available for other generations. Given a set of books, and I know you will see them in the reading room, we have a very nice Epson projector, we have a set of speakers, printer, and we also have a laptop. And I might say that I've spoken to the marketing person at Hada, and I'll be able to give to the Petit Border Secondary School at least two more computers, which we hope will help you with your reading. I want to ask you to take very good care of them, and most of all, use them so that in years to come, other children could benefit from them and that your own reading 
could improve. Once again, on behalf of Hada Education, we take this as an opportunity to present to the principal of the Petty Border Secondary School the resources that we would have purchased. Senior Education Officer Aldia Gomes Dyer thanked the Hodder Education for supporting the Ministry and the Petit Bodel Secondary with the aim of getting all students at the appropriate reading grade level. Petit Bodel Secondary School is, has been one of our strongest schools over the years. And if you look around the Petit Bodel Secondary School staff, you will see that a number of the teachers here are past students. So if a school is able to produce students who are able to come back to serve the community, then we know that the school is doing well. We want to urge the students to make the best use of the equipment that has been provided to you so that you can continue the impact that the secondary school has been making. So I want to wish you all the best and to thank Hodder Education once again and trust that this equipment will be of very good use and we will see the fruits of the fruits of the seeds that have been sown here at the Pitibadel Secondary School. Principal of the Pitibadel School, Rupert Nash, said the reading materials will go a long way in enhancing the students' literacy skills and thanked Hodder Education for the donation. On behalf of the staff and students of the Pitt Border Secondary School, I want to thank Mr. Byron Wilson and Hara Education for this generous good, um, donation. It is my hope that the equipments that we receive would go a long way in, to enhance our literacy program. So again, I want to thank Hara, and I know that we as a school will use these equipment for the betterment of the reading program and our students' development. Thank you very much again. A resident of Bekwe received the keys to a two-bedroom dwelling house last Thursday built under the government's Life to Live program. The house, which is the first to be done under the program on Bekwe, was designed to accommodate Yvonne Oliver and her physically challenged relatives who will be living there. Minister of Housing, Honorable Montgomery Daniel, said the request for assistance came around 2016 and the ministry sought to address the issue since Oliver's son and brother are both physically challenged. So, the Nemo would have assisted her over the years in terms of assisting with the rent as well as um, you know, taking care of some of the immediate things. But Nemo could not have continued, and so she would have taken some of the responsibilities on her own. And so today, we are now handing over the, this house to her. There are a bit more bits and pieces to be done, but she has indicated that she's willing to take it from here. The new homeowner also contributed to the two-bedroom house, and Minister Daniel wished her well, emphasizing that it is the policy of the government to ensure that the standard of living of Vincentians is improved. So, Madam Olivier, on behalf of the Ministry of Housing, I want to congratulate you very much for this building that you, you will be having in your possession. Thank you. Um, it looks quite an outstanding property to me. Thanks. Um, the Ministry, I know, would have had a significant expenditure on this building yes. but you equally had almost half of that contribution yes so i know that you have been very interesting in, in the building and of course that you've been showing great appreciation overall so deputy director of grand affairs herman belman noted that the event was a milestone not only for yvonne but for the northern grenadines in particular as was the f it was the first time such an initiative has been undertaken in Bekwe. I want to believe this is the first property that was designed from scratch with a wheelchair accessible ramp. 
and a bathroom facility that is accessible by wheelchair to take care of that need. And I know Yvonne has been involved in trying to, so I want this there and I want that, that and that's it right and I want to have this done. <laughs> I know Yvonne and that's how I'm sure it, it, it happened.